What do you know about Blessed Carlo Acutis? A second miracle attributed to his intercession was just recognized and his canonization will soon be finalized, making him the first millennial saint. What stands out from his life? What can we apply to ours? We're going to share the story. A lot to get to today on The Simple Truth. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. I'm Jim Havens. It is Wonder and Awe Wednesday where we strive to be rightly filled with wonder and awe at the presence of Almighty God and all that is of Him with our co-host, Joanne Wright, co-founder of the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Joanne, how are you today? And will you lead us in an opening prayer? I'll lead us and I'm doing well. Let's say a prayer to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and reparation for all, all we need to repair for in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O merciful Jesus, my King and my God, I worship you. O Blessed Mother Mary Immaculate, I cherish you. For those who offer you insult, I offer you praise. For those who offer you mocking, I offer you honor. For those who offer you disbelief, I offer you trust. For those who offer you hate, I offer you love. For those who offer you cursing, I offer you blessing. For those who offer you ridicule, I offer you gazes. For those who offer you blasphemy, I offer you adoration. For those who offer you rebellion, I offer you obedience. For those who offer you indifference, I offer you devotion. For those who offer you obstinate pride, I offer you a contrite heart. For those who offer you scorn, I offer you fidelity. Soften the hearts of those who offend you, that they may come to know you and love you as you deserve. Make my heart more fervent so I may pray without ceasing for the conversion and salvation of souls. Most sacred heart of Jesus, I place my trust in you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful prayer. And um, we are going to discuss today the life of blessed, soon-to-be saint, Carlo Acutis. He was born May 3rd, 1991, died October 12th, 2006. And um, his, uh, I guess his beatification was October 10th, 2020. Uh, so pretty quick, only 14 years after his death, and now his canonization likely to be next year, 2025. And Pope Francis is actually expected to announce the date of the canonization on July 1st. So we should know uh, in less than a month when uh, when Blessed Carlo will be canonized next year. So um, so as we, we talk about his life today, there's a lot to get to. And I was um, pretty... Um, I guess not aware much about uh, him and his life. I mean, I had seen things about him in passing. Um, and so I never really took a, a, a moment to really look into his life or, or to think too much about it other than um, the, the Eucharistic um, miracle exhibit that I knew um, he had a hand in that he actually initiated. And then it has been um, ongoing. There's a book, um, called the Eucharistic Miracles of the World that has been compiled based on that exhibition that he began. And you can learn more about that. Get that book over at therealpresence.org. So I was aware of that good work, um, but not much about his life. Again, only 15 years old um, when he died, I believe here. So, um, so what went on in this young man's life? And so the source that I really dove into to try to understand it some more, I looked at some online sources, but then I saw that his mother has written a book. Um, and so I got the book and I've been uh, reading through as much of that as I can over the, the last few days trying to prepare for this show today. And um, the name of the book, by the way, is uh, My Son Carlo, Carlo Acutis Through the Eyes of His Mother and um, really blown away by it. It has a lot in there about what he himself um, has written and, um, and things that he did episodes in his life. And it really goes through, um, just a, a supernatural, um, faith that he had that was very, very strong from a very early age and, um, just incredible to, to hear about his life and, um, and yeah, really, really impressive. So I'm excited to, to get to that. I think, um, some of maybe the, the misconceptions, at least that I had, going into this, um, we're really just, again, blown away by actually looking at a, at a real factual look into his life. Um, this guy, sometimes to me, he's presented, I've seen statues where they try to make it, you know, they look at this cool 
young guy, you know, and trying to, to make it so modern and, and all of this. I've seen quotes attributed um, online memes saying like uh, stuff about, you know, a saint in sneakers. Let's do away with the saints with the veils and uh, the cassocks. And isn't it great to have saints in sneakers? We need more of those. And that kind of stuff just kind of strikes me the, the wrong way. By the way, those quotes, they often attribute them to either Pope Francis or Pope uh, St. John Paul II, which um, if you look into it, they never said such things. So those quotes aren't even real. Uh, I think the good that you take away from a quote like that is it's just saying, can we have saints in modern times? Of course we can. We're all called to be saints, in fact. And yet there are timeless truths of our Catholic faith that are not watered down even to live out that call to holiness today. And, and we see that in the life of blessed Carlo Acutis. He had those pillars, the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady, and he's sailing right through them in the, in the church, rock solid in the faith. And you see this in his life, even in the, the, the moral teachings of the faith, very strongly living them and sharing those truths with others, spoke out about IVF, spoke out about abortion, spoke out about blasphemy, would correct his friends around him and try to lead them all to the faith specifically to come to love and adore our Lord Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. So um, just an incredible life to really dive into and learn more about. Um, and, and again, my resource here that, that I would recommend is this book by his mother, my son, Carlo, uh, which you can get uh, wherever you find books, I suppose. But Joanne, what jumps out to you as you begin to look into this? Was this um, a, a guy that you knew much about? I'm sure you probably I've heard something about him, but has was was a lot of this new to you as well? Much, much new to me. And again, I, I took you know the 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 news that oh, look at how he's dressed. They're just trying to make this hip little kid to be a saint with a computer, and you know it kind of <laughs> turned me off. Well, like you, I read about him, and going back to the clothing, I, I mean these 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 this family was well to do. They were quite wealthy, you know, and. He didn't choose to dress like like the other kids at school. He just was content with, you know, some sneakers, a, a rugby shirt, whatever, jeans, whatever. It wasn't, and I think that makes a statement with the with the statue, you know, and his and his um, a medal hanging out. And to me, that's that's a little underneath thing that he didn't care about how he dressed. So this kid was like a prodigy. He was, I think the mother said at three months old, he was trying to speak. But at three years old, he he put his coat on and, and uh, it was a few days after his grandfather died and put his coat on say, and the grandmother, which the parents worked. So the grandparents did a lot of babysitting the kid and whatever and put his coat on and the grandma says, where are you going? He says, well, I got to go to church. And gr- grandfather is, is telling me I've got to go pray for him. So he was getting these little locutions, whatever, at, at, such, at three years old, which, you know, driving him right into the church. So he was very, very special from the start. Very mm-hmm. special. Yeah, he was, um, he was baptized, I think, a couple of weeks after he was born and um, baptized in the church named after Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, which would be prophetic. And his, <laughs> his mother speaks about that in the book um, because he, the way of his death was quite sudden. And um, he, he was well prepared, though, because of his great faith and his love of our Lord and our Lady. And so um, he, he was living the gospel uh, to the full. And, and so he was very well prepared when I think his last day of school was on a September 30th. And then he ended up dying by um, October 12th. Um, so they found out that he was sick uh, very quickly. Didn't think it was maybe going to be that big of a deal. Turns out it was a a, a, a form of leukemia that was um, that takes you very quick, and very quickly. I think only three days after that diagnosis, um, he, he would pass into eternal life, and so um, so it, it was something that he seemed to be ready for, and he accepted, and he even offered it um, as a, a suffering to, to be offered um, in love, and for um, we we could get to that point where he talks about that some, but, um, but I guess I wanted to bring it back to what you were mentioning there about his grandfather. Yeah. His grandfather died when he was young and then started to appear to him in a dream saying, I'm in purgatory. You need to pray for me. And he would start praying for him. And he had this sense of, uh, of, of eternity. He had this sense of the, the souls in purgatory. He had this sense of the saints in heaven. 
which was which was kind of strange because his parents, um, why they were Catholic in, in name only, really, they um, weren't really living the faith at all. The, the mother says she had only been to um, to mass to, to receive Holy Communion, I think, at three points in her life up to then. And, um, and so he, he really didn't have the background in the faith from the parents, but there was a nanny that came in that was a faithful Polish woman, in fact, that would start to teach him at a very young age about the saints, about the, the truths of the faith. And it just seemed to stick. There was a fertile ground there. And I think that's something we can all apply to say, if we can just, if we live the faith ourselves, if we come to know the faith ourselves, and then we can share it, especially with children, even at young ages, there is fertile ground there that God can really do great things in our souls from a very young age, Joanne. Yeah, it seems like the reason he was baptized was through the grandparents, because they were both his godparents, the, the grandmother and the grandfather. So uh, without without the prayers of these faithful grandparents and, and their devotion to the Catholic faith, this who knows where Carlos would be, uh, even though he was, he kind of, was inspired the holy spirit must have set upon him early and made uh made quite his mother in fact did have dreams before he was born probably unbeknownst to her even though she was not uh using her faith rarely using her faith. so so things were things were happening i think in hindsight she realized wow what have i been given Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and really, what have we all been given this gift of faith? Uh, we receive these theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, uh, charity in um, in baptism, right? And so th- these things need to be lived. They need to be received and stirred up and lived each and every day. And we see, I would say, more than anything, the gift of faith alive in this young man, Carlo. We're going to talk about it more when we get back. Stay tuned. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg thee through the intercession and help of the archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I might have gone to church, you know, at Christmas time, gradually quit going. It's not as scary as I thought it was. It's a much more warm and open place, and God really is about love. It's not about the rules and the things that I remember as a young child. It really is about the love that God has for each one of us that's so um, deep and wonderful. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org. Podcasts of our network-produced shows are free for your listening pleasure at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Be uplifted in your faith and inspired to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on our iCatholic Radio mobile app. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright. We are discussing the life of blessed, soon-to-be Saint Carlo Acutis today. And I want to go to, um, to again, this book written by uh, Carlo's mother, my son Carlo, Carlo Acutis, through the eyes of his mother, and um, go to that um, as his death was approaching, and just kind of hear this. His last day of school was September 30th, a Saturday, It says that uh, we went to Mass. At the end of the service, Carlo wanted to recite the prayer of Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii, a prayer that he was particularly attached to. He had a close relationship with the Virgin Mary since he was little. He spoke about her frequently. He always prayed to her and invited us to do so with him. My husband and I had come back to our faith a few years prior. We discovered it thanks to Carlo. 
It was he who brought us close to God. In my life, before this happened, I had only gone to Mass three times, the day of my baptism, the day of my first communion, and the day of my wedding. She says that uh, it was not that we were opposed to faith, we were just used to living without it. She goes on to say that when we got home around evening, Carlos started to run a fever, and they decided that he would not go to school the following day. It says, um, then following on the, the following Monday that uh, the, her son Carlos spent the rest of the day relaxing, he recited the rosary, um, as he often asked me to do with him, and it was natural for him to interrupt his daily activities to pray. His relationship with God was continuous, incessant. Everything he did, he thought of God turning to him. His prayers helped him, as he said, to gather up energy and start the day's activities with increased strength and serenity. He did his homework and worked on his websites a bit on the computer. His fever did not go away, but he was able to be active and present. We all came to keep him company while he had dinner in his bedroom, and out of nowhere he said, I offer my suffering for the Pope and for the Church so as not to go to purgatory and to go straight to heaven." And then from there, it would um, his illness would uh, would uh, progress very very quickly, and um, and then he would die really just days later. Um, amazing things taking place all throughout this story. But just to zero in on those words that he um, was so um, just amazingly able to offer himself immediately into this suffering, and that offering only continued to deepen as his death approached. Um, it really a sense of peace about the whole thing and even a sense earlier on that this was coming in his life. And uh, again, I offer my suffering for the Pope, for the church, so as not to go to purgatory and to go straight to heaven. That was a prayer that he would pray at other times in his life as well in special places of pilgrimage. He lived in uh, Milan, so they were able to travel around Italy to just uh, remarkable places. Imagine being a young person with faith growing up in Milan, growing up in Italy, being able to go to these places, these great, amazing churches, all, all the relics, all the history, everything going on there. And then imagine all the young people that live there that have no faith at all and walk past all this stuff as if it's nothing. Well, this is a young man that knew what it was. He believed the faith. And that's really, to me, the, the most overwhelming witness that we see with him. What if you really believed it all? and lived it to the full. What if you really believed it to the full? How would your life reflect that? It seems to me that his life is a good reflection of one that actually believes it. A, a young person being told about Jesus, being told about the truths of the Catholic faith, the lives of the saints, the Holy Eucharist, the Eucharistic miracles, and he believes it. And then he go, what would, what does his life look like from there? We see a great fruitfulness in it. And uh, the Pope at the time, I believe, was Pope Benedict XVI, and so you wonder how those prayers may have helped him, but, um, but, but this prayer to not go to purgatory, to go straight to heaven, it's a bold prayer, it's a good prayer, and it's one that um, should be the desire of all of our hearts and to know that only by God's grace is that even possible. And so that's a good prayer to, uh, to have on our hearts and, and to pray. Um, but, um, but yeah, if, if, it, if it is God's will that we are to be in purgatory, um, if that is how it goes down, then um, we would want good people like Carlo praying for us. He had a great devotion to the holy souls in purgatory, and um, and you know just w what an example. And so, um, so that the, the whole death aspect of this, I think, is a great place um, for me to get introduced into his life because it just showed the, the the fruitfulness at the end of his life, and then reading back about what took place throughout his life you see where that fruitfulness comes from. He didn't just have this grace at the time of his death, like out of nowhere. He was living this faith every day for years throughout his life. And never, I would say it seems that he never fell into mortal sin, probably not very much venial sin. He would go to confession every Saturday weekly. Um, he was praying the, the scriptures every day, the gospels every day, going to mass every single day since the day of his first Holy Communion, never missed a daily mass. I mean, so this is the kind of life of faith uh, this young man was living and then to have uh, such a fruitful um, death, um, really incredible miracles started happening immediately, really at the time of his funeral and, and then onward. Um, so yeah, just incredible. Joanne, what jumps out to you? It just seems to me that um, it was such a sudden death and what we know, um, he must have been suffering much more than he let on and maybe just thought it was just a natural 
just a natural gift he gave to God is suffering. And he was very close with many saints, especially the young ones, uh, Jacinta and, and Francisco and St. Bernadette. And he probably saw their suffering as, as just a great gift to God and offering it up because, you know, you go in the hospital and you're, you're, You've, you're gone in a week. So it just appeared to me that he was suffering more. And the doctors treating him, they said, you know, what? we know you're having a very hard time here. And he said, look, there are people who suffer much more than me. And I guess his final words were, mom, don't be afraid. Jesus became a man. Death has become the passage towards life. And we don't need to flee it. Let us prepare ourselves to experience something extraordinary in, in the eternal life. Now, I think one of the greatest miracles is uh, even if he didn't die such a, a tragic death and, and such a short life, that the fact that he, he these parents of his were pretty much agnostic, they, they didn't go to mass or anything, that the conversion of those two and, and his mother is on her way to sainthood with the way she speaks and the way she's got such devotion um, right now, hmm. her life now, I, she, she's given up her career or whatever it was. And, and she, you know, her, her life is, is making her son known, her son, the saint known. It's, hmm. it's very, uh, uh, it's incredible to see what, what you can do to your own parents who've yeah. neglected their duty. Yeah, the graces that are before us, if we're open to them, um, they're all, they're all around us. They're all... Um, they're all for us. Uh, there's so much that is available to us every day uh, that we can so easily miss. Um, so God grant us uh, the, the humility, grant us uh, uh, the soft hearts to be able uh, to receive those graces. Um, he received them early. And, and so one of the things that is so remarkable about him that I noticed right away, and when, once the, the, the book starts to get into various things that he said, various things that he wrote, in particular, and you start to read what he was writing. And this guy was 15 and some of these writings from earlier than that. And you think about, I think about where I was at 15, lost in a world of darkness. Um, and what he is saying at 15 and even earlier, so profound, the simplicity of his faith and yet the depth of it. He would love what we do here on this show. Wonder and awe uh, is what he was all about, to look at God, to look at the things of God, look at eternity. And he was living that day to day, this sort of response of wonder and awe, but still grounded in looking at, at who's around him and how is God calling him to love the person in front of him at the same time. But uh, just profound things. And you bring up uh, uh, St. Jacinta of Fatima, and um, it says here, actually, that his, his mother states that when Carlo was younger, Jacinta appeared to him and told him that there are no words on earth that can describe the horror of hell. For this reason, he often meditated on the ultimate realities, including hell and the possibility of ending up there. Every so often, he would say to me, Mom, but do you realize what it means to go to hell for all of eternity? Try to imagine being in a place forever and ever and ever and ever. It was this deep awareness of the risk that pushed him to create his exhibit, Hell, Purgatory, and Heaven. Carla would become upset that so many risk losing themselves for all of eternity. He found it a disturbing reality. He made note of the writings of some saints who described this place. He used, them, he used those writings to catechize those who did not believe in the existence of hell. So again, he believed it. Right? And then what does he do because he believes it? He starts talking about it. He starts telling others about it. Don't you realize what's going on here? Trying to orient them to the reality of the, the, the last things, heaven, hell, judgment, uh, purgatory, death. And, and, so, um, and just, so this just makes sense in a very simple way. If you believe it, then this would be the fruit of of believing it. And so, yeah, we know about this Eucharistic Miracles exhibit. I'm sure everybody that's heard the name Carlo Acutis has heard of that. That's normally what he's associated with. Um, but he has uh, three other exhibits, I believe, as well. One on the apparitions of Our Lady, uh, one on how it says here, hell, purgatory, and heaven, and then another one, I think, on angels and demons. And so these were all things that he was initiating in his young life because 
These were things he saw as real, as true, and he could see that others weren't believing them, and he wanted to tell them about it. He wanted to help them see it, and that just makes logical sense. And so, um, so God, help us to have the graces to believe firmly in these truths uh, and to live as if they, they are true because they are, and then to share them because people do need to hear them and be invited into these truths and to do our best at trying to explain them to others. But first, that means we got to dive deeper, learn more ourselves. Um, Joanne, any further thoughts on that? Well, just the fact that, um, okay, so he was he was a bit of a mystic. He taught, he, there, were, there were visitations from Padre Pio, from St. Francis of Assisi. Um, he wanted to be buried, and, and that's where his... Uh, that's where his funeral was, I believe. But so all that aside, you you put that together with maybe a saint who's bedridden and, and just is praying all day. But he lived it in a way he he did this corporal works of mercy along with the spiritual works of mercy. He evangelized every which way. But he he would, you know, give he'd see homeless people on the street. He'd give them money. He wanted to get a job and work at a, a restaurant earn money to buy uh, tents and sleeping bags for the homeless people. It, within his school, when he um, would see bullies or whatever, he'd try and reconcile them. He saw a couple of kids having a fight one time, and he invited them over to his house later on so he could reconcile them back together. And the girls, uh, he was a nice-looking kid, He was, and he was very sweet to them, Very, and they, they all probably – wanted to be his girlfriend but he was friends with them knowing he didn't he was not into any kind of relationship dating or anything like that not that he was against it but he just said no no young I'm young but you know what I'll help you Uh, he was just a good guy I mean we all know good kids you know when we're in high school but this guy was really good and he could he could resist temptations uh, with fighting, with lust, with all that. And it was, you have to say, it was his, his fervor of the Eucharist, his adoration every day in Mass. Hmm. It yeah. saved, it's it's very special. It saves these children. Yeah, he, um, yeah, and, and again, he's Rosary. often associated. Yes, yeah, absolutely. He's often associated with, yeah, computers, websites, things like that. And, you know, they did a search of his computer for the cause of um, his cause of canonization and everything, searched his whole history from the beginning on his computer, found everything squared away, no inappropriate sites. In fact, that most of the, everything on his computer had to do with the faith. When they talk about him playing video games, he had a commitment he would never play video games more than once, uh, one hour a week. Uh, we'll be right back with more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright talking about Blessed Carlo Acuda, soon to be Saint Carlo Acutis uh, today. And so, um, yeah, so much to talk about, so much that jumps out to me uh, with him and uh, his life. It's been such a blessing diving into this book, My Son Carlo, written by his mother, Carlo Acutis, through the eyes of his mother. Um, and so he is often thought of as um, you know, we live in a time where in the church, I, I, it kind of, it kind of drives me nuts a little bit. The, um, how much it's talked about to me in a bit of a skewed way of joy, 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 everything joy. And it's like, yes, that is the fruit of the Holy spirit. Yes. Joy. Yes. The, the foundation foundational reality is God and his love for us and all these good things and these blessings and, and all of it is so beautiful and wonderful and yes, our response ought to be wonder, awe, joy at what is before us. Um, and yet there is the struggle of this earthly life, the battle that we are in that is difficult. And so, yes, this disposition of joy that is a part of that, but there's also a disposition of sorrow that is a part of that as well. And oftentimes I think that's being sort of dismissed, like you just have to have this joyful face all the time or else you're doing something wrong. Well, that wasn't the case with Blessed Carlo Acutis, even though that's that's usually how he is represented. He was normally of a joyful disposition. He was a a guy that you would say was a, um, very much um, in, in self control in terms of his um, his attitude, his emotions, his disposition. Seemed like a fun loving guy in, in many respects, but very much attuned always 
um, to God that was the center, the, the Holy Eucharist, Jesus as his center, um, and, and talking with God throughout the day, walking this, um, this daily life with Jesus every day. And, um, and that was really the core of it. So everything was oriented to that. And yet, let's just hear about this one episode. I think this is quite interesting to show a little bit of a different um, side to him. It says here that um, there was um, there was uh, one evening where he went out to dinner um, with um, with his family to uh, Portofino. It says, when we left the restaurant, uh, his mother says, I saw Carlos step a bit to the side. It was as if he was not there. He seemed a little bit. He seemed a bit sad and melancholy. I did not say anything to him. He had those moments every so often. Over time, I had learned to give him space, to leave him alone. I noticed that he also seemed particularly quiet during the trip home. We went into the house, said goodnight to the grandparents, and went to our room to sleep. I looked for him for perhaps a bit too long, and he felt that he had to say something to me. He was very sensitive. He did not want me to worry, so he took the initiative and told me what he was feeling. He said that when he left the restaurant... He heard a voice inside him speak to him. He said that he had realized that it was the voice of Jesus. He, he had told him two simple words, I thirst. Yes, the same words that Jesus said on the cross soon before he died. He explained his interpretation to me. God wanted him to understand how he felt before all that luxury, before the glitz and opulence of Portofino. There was no negative judgment, but mostly Jesus' thirst for the salvation of all people, and particularly of those who were there. I was touched by his words. I understood once more how to relate to material possession. She goes on to say, of what use is it to gain the world, to gain the whole world if we lose ourselves? Carlo himself had confided in me many times that, quote, a step of faith is a step toward being and a step away from having, end of quote. And Carlo continued to talk to me. He told me that if God owns our hearts, then what we own is infinite. So this is a, a young guy who, um, yeah, he's, he's in a wealthy family. Um, and yet that's not where his heart was. That's not what his heart was attached to. In fact, far from it. And, and that little quote, I spent some time kind of pondering that. What does that mean? A step of faith is a step toward being and a step away from having. And so whatever that step is before is that step of faith. It's a step in, in, in the being of who we are, right? It's about, it's about who we are. It's not about what we have. In fact, it's about letting go of, of various things that we have in order to step forward to God in our being. So it's to be stripped away. And yes, he is, um, very providentially, uh, buried the place of his burial where you can go visit, um, his, I believe incorrupt body is in a CC and not just in a CC, but in the place where they, the church and the chapel where they believe is the spot that St. Francis divested himself. He, he took his clothes off as, as a form of his, um, of his poverty and then was clothed in the robe of the bishop and, and accepting God as his father fully in that moment. This, this amazing moment in the life of Francis of his divesting of the world and his saying yes to God completely um, very appropriate. That was his favorite saint. The, the family had a, a second home in Assisi and spent a lot of time there. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting to really get into the reality of what his life really was and what this man was, this young man was really like uh, versus just kind of the way that he is portrayed oftentimes uh, on a surface sort of, even kind of like a worldly sort of portrayal of him. He was much deeper, much more uh, profound from those uh, surface portrayals that we see, Joanne. To have the wisdom and, and knowledge at that young age of the riches of the world are, are will get you nowhere, um, except if you want to use them for God, whatever. But to he lived he lived the mysteries of the rosary. You know he was joyful, but he knew uh, Jesus showed him the sorrows, uh, especially when he went out and saw the homeless. And here he's he's dining and and. Uh, probably sick to his stomach thinking, I have all this. And there was a, another story when um, his, his, he never wanted to go on glamorous vacations or anything. He just wanted to go on pilgrimages. So that the parents took, took him to many places, Lord's Fatima, wherever. And at one point the father says, let's go to the Holy land. You know, let, let's, let's go see where Jesus walked. And he said, Oh no, no, no. 
why would we go there when I can stay right here and be with him in person, right in adoration? And how how many of us get caught up in that? You know, we want we're so curious. We want to be, um, and and that's that's normal. That's that's I'm sure our lady is very pleased when we want to be close to her in pilgrimages, whatever. But he had a sense that no, I can be with God right here, and and that that's. That is a, a true gift of the Holy Spirit, his wisdom and knowledge there. Um, he, he just was very simple, very simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and he was um, still in the world, though not of it, um, by and large. And so, uh, and he was still reaching out to his peers, um, people that um, sometimes were going a very different path, and he would try to correct them. He was a catechist for younger kids, but he also tried to help his peers. Here's a a little bit on that. It says that um, he did have friends who went to nightclubs, used drugs, and drank a lot of alcohol. On various occasions, they would invite him to come along, but Carlo hated nightclubs. He had very strong signs from his guardian angel alerting him to the danger of these places. He told some cloistered monks about these signs and had asked us to join him in praying for this intention. Um, And then it says also that he was not happy when people would ask him, but do you have a girlfriend? He was convinced that middle school was too early to think about these things. Unlike him, many of his friends had gotten an early start on romantic life, which often takes away the purity and youthfulness, which should characterize boys and girls of that age. He loved to cite the example of St. Maria Goretti in this regard. It says, my mother was also convinced that this was an extraordinary, that he had an almost extraordinary heroic purity. And he would um, talk about the virtue of chastity to his peers. And he would talk about um, marriage and the holiness of marriage to his peers. And when people would denigrate those things, uh, he would speak up. And again, he would speak up on, on various topics when things were, um, were, were said that were not right or appropriate. And uh, he always seemed to try to do it in a gentle way. But nevertheless, um, there was a very um, matter-of-fact way about him where it was just, of course, I'm going to say something. This person needs correction almost as a gift to them to, to give that correction. And so he would do that, again, especially in times of um, when, when people were blaspheming our Lord. He had uh, very strong things to say on those occasions. And he would, he, he, he had a great knowledge and understanding of the faith because he was deep in studying it. He spent a lot of his free time studying the lives of the saints and the writings of the saints. So oftentimes in, in situations like that, he would rely upon saint quotes that he knew. And so he would come out with like a great saint quote about blasphemy that was really strong and it would kind of just stop everybody in their tracks. Um, so a pretty good method there from blessed Carlo, Acutis that um, that maybe could be a, a model uh, for many of us, Joanne. I think uh, all all these he knew so much about saints, but you think twenty years ago, you can't just push a name in and get everything you want. He had to look look into things, and I, I'm sure he was inspired, you know, by saints. Like you said, he he had locutions, he had you know, he was hearing things, and it was not. It was not some, oh, I, he wouldn't broadcast these things. It came out little by little through his mother, and she probably didn't get the gist of it. He saw, too, um, they, he liked to play the video games. He, he got a kick out of it, whatever. He limited himself. He was very prudent with it and temperate. But he saw, he saw what it did to other kids, and he said they'd be playing it for, you know, half hour, hour, and, and then he could see how edgy they would get and they'd get violent. And, and that's when he knew, I can't, I can't, I can't get into this. Look what it's doing. It's taking, first of all, it's taking me away from Jesus. Secondly, uh, something's getting in. There's some kind of portal or something that got in. So he, he just saw this and this was at probably a very young age because that's when all these things were coming out. So it's, it's remarkable that, uh, like the, the mother said, he had a simple spirituality and it's possible for everybody, but because he didn't have stigmata, he didn't have apparitions or levitations. He had this simple childhood that it seems like Our Lady asked at Fatima, just live simply, live your vocation, 
no more, no less. And everything he did was was for Jesus, through Jesus, and Jesus. Where did we hear that? From St. Louis de Montfort. Give everything to Our Lady. She'll take it right to Jesus. Yeah, and what a love of Our Lady uh, he had and a love of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Again, the, the pillars that should be there in our life of faith for all of us. Um, here's a little bit of what he, um, what, what his mom says about the way that he would speak oftentimes. She says, to tell the truth, sometimes it felt like listening to a priest and it made me smile to listen to him tell others that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is how he would speak to his peers when they needed a little bit of uh, formation in the faith when it came to the virtue of, of chastity and understanding who they were and what human sexuality really was. It says he often spoke of the Holy Trinity and said, the father has a throne in heaven and also the son who sits to his right, but the Holy Spirit has our hearts for a throne, which become a temple of God. For this reason, he continued, we must respect the sacredness of our soul and our body and not trivialize love by reducing it to a simple economy of pleasure aimed only at satisfying self-serving desires and not at true goodness. Um, it says he cared a lot about chastity and the sacrament of matrimony. If one of his friends criticized the sacrament of matrimony or trivial, trivialized it, he always repeated with deep conviction that we must follow Jesus's teachings and wait for marriage before having sexual intercourse. On multiple occasions, I remember hearing him yelling at friends of his who bragged about visiting pornographic websites or who read things that he defined as damaging to the soul. He told them that in doing so, they were becoming like the marionettes in Pinocchio, that they were being used for, like the, the ones in the story that were being used for shows and then thrown directly into the fire. It was his metaphorical way of illustrating what happens to souls who are not able to resist temptation and allow themselves to be led astray and overcome by their vices. I want to reemphasize that for him, staying away from pornographic websites or inappropriate literature was not prudishness. It was rather the only way not to be poisoned, not to open the door to attitudes that can leave a bitter taste in your mouth and not make you happy. Happiness, he said, is loving others like God loves them and not unloading your own selfish desires on them. So again, the wisdom in, uh, in, in this young man, it just uh, incredible. But that's what comes from a life of real faith. We want to live this life of faith and instill it in others. Uh, she also says that her son performed his first miracles on the day of his funeral. A woman who had breast cancer and had not yet started chemotherapy invoked Carlo and was healed. Another woman from Rome, 44 years old, who had come from the capital just to say goodbye to Carlo for the last time, prayed to him because she was not able to have children. She asked for this grace from Carlo a few days after the funeral. She learned she was pregnant. Nine months later, a baby girl was born. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright talking about the life of Blessed Carlo Acuda, soon to be St. Carlo Acuda. It's going to be announced, at least the, um, the announcement for the announcement uh, is supposed to be, uh, is, has been given that it's supposed to be July 1st when the announcement uh, for the canonization date for Carlo will be um, will be announced by Pope Francis, and that's likely to be sometime next year, 2025. So stay tuned for that. Um, here's a little bit just more from uh, the words of Carlo himself on his love of Our Lady. It says here that Carlo always had a great devotion to the Eucharist and the Virgin Mary. He would say, quote, Each time that we address the Mother of God, we place ourselves in direct and immediate contact with heaven. It is almost as if we enter. In calling her full of grace, in invoking her in this manner, we attest to our filial faith. We believe in her in this way. We hope that she is the giver of all things good, of every grace. We say pray for us. That is, we invite her to use her status to meet us halfway. We address her, knowing that she is omnipotentia suplex, omnipotent for intercession, her intercession is assured. Her intervention is taken for granted. Her prayer is infallible. The human race, through Mary, was given supernatural dignity. God associated himself with a creature, a mother, a mystery. And um, it, it, this is an, a, an amazing chapter in the book, by the way, that his, um, his mom wrote, My son Carlo, the chapter, In the End, My Immaculate Heart Will Triumph, right at the end of the book. And I just want to add this quote in that um, 
that his mom does give regarding the hour of triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She says, it will concede with the coming of the universal reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. As St. Maximilian Kolbe stated, modern times are dominated by Satan and will be more so in the future. The Immaculata alone has from God the promise of victory over Satan. However, assumed into heaven, the Mother of God now requires our cooperation. She seeks souls who will consecrate themselves entirely to her, who will become in her hands effective instruments for the defeat of Satan and the spreading of God's kingdom upon earth. Um, So they seem to be right on it. And um, yeah, this is a this is a young man worth getting to know, Carlo Acutis, blessed Carlo Acutis, soon to be Saint Carlo Acutis, and asking for his intercession, maybe to uh, to be able to um, to have greater faith, so that our prayers to the Blessed Mother can be stronger, because we really believe in the one who we're speaking to, and then our love of our Lord Jesus, of course, being strengthened as well, and everything else um, in the process. Um, so we need help. That should be sure for every single one of us. So we got a great helper here in this young man. And um, and hopefully uh, by invoking him with faith, uh, he's going to help us to get closer in, in every way uh, to who we are called to be in this life and then for all eternity, Joanne. Yeah, and, and if I if I had children now and I do have grandchildren, I want to, I just want to ask God, like, how can I... How can I teach my kids? How can I teach my kids to be like him? Or what What was that special thing? And I think it was, well, with all his other prayers and his, his detachment to the world, it, it was the adoration. And he had a beautiful quote about adoration. Um, a lot of us go to adoration and we don't get past our sinfulness and our, our reparation for our sins, which isn't fair. I don't think that's so fair to God. I mean, we are sinners and we do need to um, uh, make reparation when we go in there, but we have to listen and we have to listen what he's going to tell us. And this quote about adoration that, that Carlos gave, um, it was, it was just so, uh, t- I don't know, listen to it. When it, he says, when a thin ray of light shines in a semi-dark room, you can see the dust in the air with your naked eye. In fact, it's the specks of dust found along the beam of light themselves, which spread the light in every direction. Just like how you can see the moon in the night sky, the same thing happens to our soul. During Eucharistic adoration, we're struck by the light that radiates from the Eucharist. In this way, we're able to see all the dust that pollutes our soul and keeps us from progressing along the path to holiness that we cannot normally see with our naked eye. So, so we go to adoration, and and we're we're in another world there. If we allow, if we allow Jesus to come in, because He'll show us, He'll show us our soul. It's it's your mini judgment, uh, just you know, a little sense of a mini judgment. You want to, you just give Him everything. Let go. He forgets your sins. He forgets you, you're you're repentant for your sins he forgets them and just adore him and let him work in you let him work in your kids bring your kids to adoration say the rosary with your kids encourage them encourage them for uh daily mass even um it's it's the yeah. it's the only way it's the only way yeah. for our kids yeah i think a sense to i've been <laughs> reflecting on that same thing about um yeah what was the key here and um, again, there's a supernatural grace, a gift that's been given here, but we're all given that to some degree, again, in our baptism, that theological virtue of faith, hope, and charity. Um, he had a, a guide in his nanny who was teaching him from a very early, early age. Again, it just stuck and he was off and running. He believed it. And, and that was the thing. It got rooted in there. It got anchored in his heart and in his mind and in his soul that this is real. So that even what you're saying, like, a lot of it, it comes out of just his, so, his his firm belief in what the church teaches on faith and morals. It's true. So I believe it. And then therefore, how do I live? And so he would have an understanding even of um, indulgences and not the disordered understanding, but the actual understanding of how they work and say, well, wait a minute here. I get a, the, the church gives a plenary indulgence for this. Well, then maybe I should be mindful of that. And so he would say, 
uh, go to adoration, try to stay for at least 30 minutes because at that 30 minute mark, plenary indulgence, the church gives you. And so I want to do that. I want to offer that up for a soul that needs it. Right. And then also, um, I want to pray the rosary. Well, I'm going to try to get somebody to pray it with me because if I pray it with somebody else, plenary indulgence, right? And so he had an understanding of those things. He researched those things and knew them and then wanted to live them. And so, yeah, the sense that I have on it too, I I think for those of us that maybe didn't have it anchored in so early, didn't have that gift um, to, to be healed from all of those things that took place maybe until we started to really respond to that gift of faith and started to live it um, because there's so much junk that can happen before a, a conversion, before a response of faith. Obviously, it's best to have that response right away in, in that time of innocence before committing any grave sins and to be off and running. That's the, the ideal. That's going to be how it works the best. So, so maybe can we just go back a little, bring our hearts to our Lord and say, uh, can you heal my 15 year old heart? I wasn't where Carlo was. Can you heal where I was? Can you heal where I was all the, that time up until my initial conversion? Can, 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 can that somehow be brought to you and can you pour your grace upon it? And can that innocence be restored? And can I, can, can all of those impediments be purified in some way where now I can live it. And then, um, obviously I think to pray and intercede for others, uh, for their healing and for their innocence and their restoration so that, um, yeah, they can, they they can be less obstacles in their spiritual life and in their ability to really believe and to live the faith, Joanne. Yes. And, and we, we have to understand Teach our children not to be afraid to die. We're afraid to die because we're we're living in these broken bodies. Um, the, his mother found right after his death. She found the word test, or she was told the word testament. She heard it. She found it on his desktop where he said, "When I reach seventy kilos, kilos about one hundred and fifty pounds, I'm destined to die." Imagine if she knew this that that he had gotten this little word of of from God about his death it, it would have frightened me to death but he kept it because he knew it would pressure but again we can't be afraid to die we if we die as martyrs we there's our, a pathway to heaven right straight up. so pray for it pray for a happy death pray to St. Joseph happy yeah. death yeah he's often shown with the backpack his mom likes that because that's that sense of that pilgrimage of this earthly life towards eternity. He was focused on moving towards eternity. He saw this life in that context. God bless you all.